Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 460 registered attendees for today's webinar. I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. And to let you know, we've now automated the post-webinar survey and certificate process and hope that you'll find it more convenient. The survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you will receive about an hour after this webinar has finished. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. One lucky attendee will still win an Amazon gift card for completing the survey. Okay, let's kick off today's webinar by giving away an OR Today live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Today's sponsor, Medline, is headquartered in Illinois. What is the name of the first and oldest hospital built in Chicago? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, uh, just a reminder that our fifth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference takes place this weekend at the Palms Casino Resort and Spa in Las Vegas. Join us to discover new opportunities, broaden your knowledge, and exchange ideas. Registration is still open, and for more information, visit ortodaylive.com. Okay, and let's see who has won our OR Today surprise pack. And it's a congratulations to Ren Scott. Congratulations, Ren. Of course, the answer is Mercy Hospital. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Medline Industries. Medline is the largest privately held manufacturer and sorry, distributor of medical supplies uniquely positioned to provide products, education, and support across the continuum of care. Medline's ability to bring best practices from one care setting to another, from large health care systems and independent physician practices to home health patients and their families is what sets them apart. For more information, visit Medline.com. Okay, our presenter today is Dr. Rosie Lyles, Director of Clinical Affairs at Medline Industries. Rosie, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who was attending, who have signed in to hear my talk today, and also to OR today to allow me to talk to you about a very important topic and how we can prevent surgical site infections by using topical antiseptics. I only have one disclosure. I am an employee of Midline Industries. So my overall objective today for this webinar would be the following to explain the clinical and economic impacts of surgical site infections, known as SSIs, on patients as well as healthcare facilities, describe factors that increase risk of SSIs, and discuss effective strategies to prevent SSIs, discuss clinical evidence related to the use of effective antiseptic agents to reduce infections, and lastly, also to identify strategies to enhance patient compliance to prevent these surgical site infections. First, I'll just discuss about the clinical and economic impact of surgical site infections. As an introduction, I think it's very important to announce and to say that preventing surgical site infections is a primary goal of all healthcare providers. And the key to do this successfully is understanding the risk factors for surgical site infections implementing effective infection prevention strategies, also providing proper education to ensure or boost compliance with patients as well. If you look at the overall hospital acquired infections, you know, in the uh, healthcare setting today, we know that pneumonia as well as surgical site infections are tied as the highest of infections that we see in the acute care setting. But if we go down a second, you know, more deeper to see at the cost, how these infections affect not only the cost of these infections, but also the length of stay for patients overall, we know that for surgical site infections, it ranged between $20,000 to $42,000 in reference to, uh, to pay for these uh, clinical infections caused by FOMERSA. Also, the length of stay can increase from 11 days to 23 days, depending upon if they have a MRSA infection or just a staph infection caused by surgical site infections. 
But also we know that there's a scenario in reference to the estimated for hospitals costs associated with preventable HAIs. If the healthcare facility does not have the antiseptics available to prevent these infections, and we know from data that shows that if you do not have these antiseptic agents available to prevent these infections, it can cost you around $14,000 to $41,000 per infection in the U.S. for surgical site infections. Also, we know that there is a direct cost for surgical site infections. It has the prolonged length of stay, you have readmissions, additional visits, additional procedures, lab tests, prolonged antibiotic use, home care, and additional drugs, and professional fees. But there's also an indirect cost when you think about the patients and how it affects patients as well. They have lost productivity from work. They can't work. Also, they have a mental um, decapacity in reference to the, the known of having an infection from their surgery, but also from the healthcare facility, they have an indirect cost as well. You have the indirect cost for labor, indirect cost for the facility used out of pocket, and also, too, patients can give a bad report in reference to the satisfaction of the service they receive from being an inpatient as well. So if we look at the factors that increase the risk of surgical site infections, we know that from data that surgical site is the result of a microbial contamination of the surgical site itself. We know there's, you know, microbial sources that can happen in reference to the androgynous, meaning that the bacteria from the patient's own skin, as well as there's androgynous, as well as meaning reference to the environment, healthcare providers, as well as surgical equipment, can also can be a factor of this as well. But we know from clinical evidence data that the number one pathogen that causes all HAIs, including surgical site infections, are staph aureus across the board from uh, clinical data. We know that. Also, we know that the CDC put out from the vital signs saying that staph kills and that we have to do more not only in acute care settings, but also in reference to the community settings to how we can prevent these infections that are caused by the number one pathogen that causes surgical site infections and others as well. So if we look at other risk factors overall in reference to um, for surgical site infections, here's a good example in reference to looking at the risk of the stratification for SSIs in colon cancer. This was a retrospective study that included over 1,400 patients from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital from a 10-year period. And what they found was that stratified you know, uh, risk factors are the following from those patients who are smoked versus those who do not, patients who abuse alcohol, patients who have type 2 diabetes, obese patients, as well as the risk factor of if the surgery duration was longer than 140 minutes. But also, if you combine those risk factors together, unfortunately, you will have a higher risk factor as well, meaning that the patient with one or fewer risk factors the risk factor rate would be 2.3. However, if the patient had two or more, it would increase twofold to 5.2%. If the patient had three risk factors, the risk factor for surgical site infection would be 7.8. And lastly, if the patient had four or more risk factors, it would increase greater than 13.5%, unfortunately. Now, this is a nice fish diagram from Dr. Chuck Edmiston, and so it gives you a very high level and overview of all the factors that can come into play when you have an increased risk of surgical site infections, not only for preoperative uh, factors, but also it goes into perioperative as well as the organization management factors from the surgeon, the environment, and the patient as well. For my talk today, I want to focus primarily on the preoperative factors in reference to the lack of body um, decolonization for patients who do not uh, prep their skin appropriately. And also we know that if patients have several or certain type of infection caused by staph aureus like MRSA or MSSA, 
with nasal decolonization, that's a key factor as well that can cause an infection for these patients. So if we look at the surgical site prevention strategies, they are the following. Clinical evidence has shown that preventing SSIs is the primary goal for all patients undergoing um, operation as well as invasive procedures. You have decolonization, strict aseptic technique in all phases of patient care, maintaining a normal uh, temperature for the patients, also control of blood glucose level, and patient education is key as well. But we also know from the clinical evidence from not only from what the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of CDC and the World Health Organization, known as WHO, this is a nice review of the guidelines that shows that if you are doing a re reduction of infections, both of the national and public, public health departments and government agencies state that a standardized shower two days before surgery, as well as nasal decolonization is key to preventing these infections. So both guidelines stress that in both um, prevention areas. So for decolonization strategies, they are the use of a topical antiseptic or antibiotic to reduce the body surface bacteria to prevent carriage or infection. We know that from clinical evidence and from daily use that we commonly use chlorhexidine gluconate for the skin and for wound bathing but also mupirocin, which is an antibiotic, and iodophore, also known as povonidine, which is an antiseptic for the nose. We know you can use these antiseptics as well as the antibiotic for these vulnerable, high-risk populations of patients, particularly those who are going to the ICU settings and those who are having surgery. We know they can also be used against multidrug-resistant organisms, as well as CHG and iodophore, have been used in healthcare for over 60 years and have a good, strong safety record to prevent these infections as well. So if you look at decolonization uh, prevention, what happens, you know, in these unfortunate, you know, events over time? And this was a nice uh, presentation that was done back in 2015 with Dr. Susan Wong in a roundtable presentation she gave at the CDC. And here's my nice friend on the corner here to the right of your screen of a patient who is colonized with certain pathogens and just shedding in the environment. But we know that patients shed these pathogens, for example, staph, or it's or MRSA in the environment. Then the environment becomes contaminated, unfortunately. The contamination persists because of failure to clean or to disinfect the area. The staff acquires it because they fail to remove it from not having good proper hand hygiene, the patient transfers to one patient to another, and there's the risk of an infection that can happen if you do not have proper decolonization strategies in place. We know that if you do decolonize, you can prevent shedding, but even more so, you will have a broader solution for all MDROs that are carriers as well as causing infections. And if you look to know, like, what are the MDROs that we're dealing with currently right now, these are a nice list of the NAS, I would say, deadliest pathogens that we have, unfortunately. And these are all positive for gram positive, gram negative, as well as some fungus that we have here that we're dealing with, with MDROs. But two different strategies that we use in healthcare when we're trying to prevent infections in reference to decolonization. The first one would be a targeted decolonization meaning that the patient is screened on admission for staph aureus or MRSA carriers, you know, in the nasal um, cavity. If the patients are positive for that, the patients undergo decolonization remedy from the skin as well as the nares. However, for universal decolonization, we could care, we more focus primarily on all patients who are subject to skin and nasal decolonization, but it's not specifically towards certain pathogens. So these are all pathogens that we're trying to reduce and to prevent infections from. And also we know who recently back in March, the CDC put out nice guidelines in reference to saying that if you want to implement these um, interventions to reduce not only device but procedure related hospital acquired infections, there's a nice section here on this webpage in reference to the surgical site prevention. It actually states in reference to using mupirocin as well as iodophore or covenidine with chlorhexidine gluconate washes 
or wipes in reference to preventing these uh, surgical site infections, which is key. But not only does the CDC recommend it, there are other guidelines as well that say that you should have skin bathing prior to surgery to prevent these infections. They are SHEA, A-R-R-N, APIC, as well as IDSA. They all say that chlorhexidine is a frequent recommended antiseptic, but it's well known to use to prevent these infections caused by the pathogens on patient's skin. Not only are we thinking about in reference to these pathogens on patient's skin, we know from clinical evidence that there are patients who are just generally colonized with certain pathogens on, the, uh, on their skin, primarily with Staph aureus. And if you see on the right-hand side of the corner, those are those patients who are Staph or its carriers. And as you can see, the nose is, has 100% they will be colonized with that versus any other part of the body is not as high as those in the nares. And so you wonder, why do we want to decolonize you know, patients in the nose? It's because approximately 30% of the population is colonized with staph aureus in the nose. We also know that majority, 80% of all staph aureus infections are caused by patients on skin floor. We also know that nasal carriages of Staph aureus is a significant risk factor of developing a surgical site infection you know, with Staph aureus in patients who are orthopedic surgeons, surgery. And we also know that in orthopedic surgery patients, the risk of a surgical site infection caused by Staph aureus in the nares is 5.8 times higher than those patients who are non-nasal carriages. So we have to do more in the nose to prevent these um, cross-contamination and uh, causing infections, not only in the skin, but also in the nose. There's also professional guidelines for nasal decolonization that also stress and say that we should decolonize patients, surgical patients with a anti-cacal, uh, cephalococcal agent in a preoperative setting for high-risk procedures, including those for orthopedics as well as cardiothoracic procedures. Those are also supported by APIC, SHEA, IDSA, as well as ARN that stress to say that we can and we should use these, not only the agents for mupirocin, but also povidone iodine to stress to prevent those infections are key. But we know from traditional approach from uh, decolonization, for many years we have used mupirocin, which is an ointment, has been traditionally used. That has been the gold standard for many years. However, studies have shown that for nasal decolonization with mupirocin as part of the preoperative and inpatient protocol can reduce the risk of infection. We know now, unfortunately, that there's a challenge that has come uh, has arrived, that when you use mupirocin twice a day for five days straight, patient compliance can vary, unfortunately. But also, there's evidence that's shown that the mupirocin has a high resistant rate, unfortunately, that we've been using, unfortunately, as well. So we know now from back in 2015, where the CDC and the White House put out the call to action in reference to we need to educate and train more about antibiotic stewardship by using these antibiotics inappropriately, as well as unnecessary in the acute care settings. We also know not only that mupirocin is a problem, not only in America, but this is a global problem in reference to uh, mupirocin resistance. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, several countries, not only cities, but several countries like New Zealand, West, Western Australia, Brazil, they all have had seen a high level of resistance of mupirocin over time. But if you see here in the U.S., there was a study that was done with 29 ICUs and 13 U.S. hospitals. Just over, I would say, an 18-month time period, the high-level resistance increased from 10% to 17% for the resistance for mupirocin being used for those patients, unfortunately. So we have to do something more to uh, prevent not only the, um, the MRSA outbreaks, but also a different approach for an effective use when we try to have an alternative for nasal decolonization. We know that uh, povidone iodine has been widely used and there is a non-irritation for using that for patients. We know also that it's very active against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. 
also to date that there is no evidence of bacterial resistance when you use this. Very different from using the Pearson versus using pogon iodine before surgery, the healthcare provider can, can apply this one hour prior to surgery. That makes it more of a higher compliance, but also it's easy to use as well with less patients for reactions, as well as none that uh, with some irritations as well for patients. So now I wanna get into the actual clinical evidence that is related to the use for effective antiseptic agents to reduce surgical site infections that we have. The first one, we can look at the home application for um, surgical site prevention using CHG. This was a study that was done, looked at patients who used the 2% CHG impregnated cloth before surgery for uh, shoulder surgery to show that using the CHG versus using soap and water. And as you can see from the actual table below, that the overall rate for cultures for patients was much lower for those who bathed with the CHG cloth versus those who used the soap and water bathe for surgical site prevention. Here's another study that was done by Dr. Chuck Edmiston to look at comparison of a clinical trial of looking at clinical efficacy for cleaning with CHG. This study was used to compare not only the 2% uh, impregnated cloth and as well as 4% CHG soap by using a standardization for time periods for those patients before they had surgery. And what they found was for patients who showered twice with 4% CHG, the liquid, or with the 2% CHG cloth, showed a mean MIC ratio ranging from 25.3% to 350 times the concentration required to kill a staph or it's as including not only MRSA, but also MSSA as well. Now, in the, for several clinical evidence, we have seen for many years that they have recommended for patients to have to shower two nights before surgery. However, this was a study that was uh, presented at Shea this year um, from Duke University. And what they asked for patients to do is from this multi-center, non-randomized uh, prospective cohort study for patients who are undergoing not only hip and knee replacement, but also for those who are having spinal surgery as well in two large-scale academic centers. Patients were given one or two instructions here in this study. They were using, in group one, CHG soap was given for five days prior to surgery and also the day in the morning of the application. In group two, they used CHG scrub just the night before in the morning of, which would be a total of two applications of CHG. And what we have found here on the actual screen overall in the blue bar, that would be considered in reference to the high concentration of CHG from the, uh, the two-day scrub versus the six-day scrub was higher in reference to the 97% overall. And what they found was that preoperative six-day CHG scrub application led to a higher skin preoperative CHG concentration versus the two-day scrub approach approach. The higher proportion of patients who met the CHG concentration threshold for gram-positive bacteria as well as Klebsiella pneumoniae, the carbaminopase producers with the six-day application than the two-day scrub brush application in this cohort for patients. So even though we know from data, they always ask patients to do two nights before, this is an example of you can actually increase it not only to two days, but also to six days in the morning of to prevent these infections as well. This is another study that was done looking at the efficacy for the advance for preoperative CHG uh, preparing protocol. And for these patients here, they were actually comparing those who bathed at home before surgery to prep their skin versus those who only got the preparation in hospital. And as you can see overall, there was a typical significant lower level of infection for those patients who used the CHG at home, which was 0.5% of infections, versus those patients who only cleansed the skin in the hospital, which was close to 2% for those infections. However, in healthcare systems, we're not only trying to prevent infections, but also we want to implement a protocol that could be 
cost effectiveness. And we also see in this study that using CHG actually had a network saving of around $2.1 million for annual expectation for over $3.1 billion if they were to use this implement completely. So it's not only effectiveness to reduce infections, but it was also cost effective overall as well. But we know from big data, from this facility that was done a huge um, study over 20 hospitals in nine states. This was a huge bundle approach to use to prevent infections overall for patients who were going in for cardiac hip as well as knee surgeries. And what they did in this study here for patients, they had a patient who was preoperatively nerves in the nose that was screened for those who were positive in the notes for MRSA as well as MSSA. Also, patients were decolonized with not only Nupirocin but also used uh, CHG bathing for the skin. And they also received a prophylactic antibiotic as well as a bundle approach. And what we saw here in this study that was done back in 2015, that after the three month phase in period that was done in two, uh, 2012 on your screen here, that the bundle adherence of 83% for all of those uh, patients who were using this bundle approach intervention to prevent infection. Overall, there was only 101 infections that occurred after 28,000 operations during a pre-intervention phase. However, post-intervention phase, only 29 occurred out of a 14,300 operations. So we know here that the bundle approach works when you're screening as well as decolonizing and giving prophylactic for patients for MRSA for surgery. Here's another example here in reference to using polar iodine as an effective to reducing the risk of surgical site infections as well as lowering hospital costs. This was a very significant study that showed that they had fewer staph aureus deep surgical site infections that develop in patients who would be colonized with povidone iodine, which was about 1.8%, compared to patients who was decolonized with mupirocin, which was 8.9%. So here in this study that was done back in 2014, that nasal iodine may be considered as an alternative to mupirocin as part of the bundle intervention. Also, we know from universal decolonization, when you're using polar iodine compared to just targeting for patients, meaning your screening and treatment, as a result, there was a dramatic lower hospital cost, meaning that the mean cost for a nasal swab was around $27, specifically different when you look at the mean cost for MRSA screening, which is over $120. So if you don't screen patients, on admission before and just decolonize them, there is also a net savings as well as a benefit to prevent infections too. So we know that, you know, from a regional approach that we have patients coming all over from the nursing homes, LTAC facilities, and they're bouncing around from state to state, so it can vary at times. But we know that there's certain, even though there's the same need for infection control, we do know they are not the same overall. However, this was a study that was done by Dr. Susan Wong that was published this year that showed that there are decolonizing patients after post-discharge, you know, for those patients who are among the MRSA carriers. And what they did here was they conducted a multi-center randomized control trial in over 30 different facilities where they compared in one arm just to educate patients on what they should do to prevent infections versus another arm where they actually educated them, but also included a decolonization bundle where they used chlorhexidine mouthwash as well as polar iodine, I'm sorry, they used mupirocin as well as CHG bathing for a time for six months, and they followed these patients over a one-year time period. Overall, what they found was from post-discharge, MRSA decolonization led to a 30% lower risk for MRSA infections than just education alone. So that's a benefit if you're trying to continue to decolonize patients not only before surgery, during a stay in the hospital, but also post-discharge as well. So for the past several um, 
I don't know how long, several slides, I've been focusing on primarily on the skin as well as the nasal. However, when you think about the, the use of long-term CHG, some may have some concerns with that. What I can tell you is that CHG uh, resistance is always a possibility. However, with widespread use, CHG has resistance has not been reported. Also, we know that CHG use should be limited to indications in which the benefit is well documented in how you want to use CHG. Also, there's a question in reference to how does CHG affect the skin microbiome? And so we know from clinical studies that show when you are comparing CHG daily application to those who are being bathed with diluted bleach in the water, that tropical decolonization does not eradicate the skin microbiota, meaning the good bacteria from patient's skin. And lastly, we know that there are certain ethnicity that may play a role in adverse effects, meaning those patients who are Asian or Japanese patients may have a more susceptibility to develop an IgGE um, immune response to chlorhexidine than those who are Caucasian uh, frequently. We also have seen in the past, too, from those same population of patients that may use a CHG coated catheter, they have a more reported of having adverse effects versus those who are not. So speaking about just CHG overall, not only for decolonization for the nose and for the skin, I think they're all the mouth decolonization is also extremely, extremely important, and it also plays a critical role in preventing infections. We know that if we don't have, you know, antibiotics, uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs in place, as well as good anti um, agents that are involved, like CHG, that there's a cost involved in reference to uh, being able to associate pneumonia as well as hospital acquired pneumonia. If you don't have that, the burden of those infections can range from $19,000 to $44,000 per infection for those patients, unfortunately. And if you look at big data from the state of Pennsylvania, they showed as well that the risk of having, for example, non-vented hospital-acquired pneumonia cases for over a three-year time period, they had over 5,000 uh, patients cases of that, which cost over $150 million to treat that. So we have to do more when we're trying to prevent the non-vented hospital-acquired infections for patients as well for VAP. But we know that from data that not only that you find in a community setting as well as in the hospital, that Staph aureus and MRSA can be all over the patient's body for anatomic sites as well. This is a study that was done back in 2014 here in the Chicago region, where we looked at atomic sites for community-acquired MRSA. And one of the areas that we found a high level of it was in the patient's throat as well, which is interesting, which shows, and goes back to what the CDC focused on from the vital science, and that we should be doing more, not only in acute care settings, but also in the community base, because there are patients coming in the healthcare system. And we know that a picture is worth a thousand words when you can see over time a bacteria that can grow in the patient's mouth for those who are not decolonized or using anything to clean the mouth appropriately. We know that an unclean mouth can have about 100 million to 1 billion bacteria on each teeth, meaning the plaque for it. And also we know that oral bacteria can replicate five times within a 24 hour time period. So we have to do more to prevent these infections. Also, we know that 80% of all infections are caused by the formation of the biofilm. So we not only need to have the rinse of using the antiseptic, but also the mechanism of using the brush, which is a good picture here on the left-hand side of the screen, and the one in the middle actually shows a single brush from a patient with bacteria from the mouth from using, from, um, from cleaning their teeth. So we have to do more trying to prevent not only the surgical site infections, but also for pneumonia as well. And there's a JAMA study that was published that showed when you have a bundle approach, it can reduce infections, but also when you have a universal decolonization where you're using polvon iodine with not only pre-surgical CHG bathing and when you use an oil rinse like CHG, it can result in a 70% reduction 
in infections compared to no decolonization strategy at all completely. We also know from a clinical evidence study here that was done looking at two big clinical studies for over um, 2,000 patients as a review of looking at patients who use uh, CHG to decolonize their mouth before ongoing you know, elective surgery. And what they found was there was a huge reduction, not only for using CHG, but when you compare those patients who had post-operative pneumonia versus those who did not decolonize, we know that the range from using CHG decreased the infection rate to 5.3% to those who did not use CHG for post-operative pneumonia, it increased double by 10.4%. So here's a good example here where patients are undergoing not only just surgery, but elective cardiothoracic uh, surgery or cardiovascular surgery. If you decolonize their, um, their mouth, including as well, you can also prevent postoperative pneumonia. This is another study that was done in the annual thoracic surgery this year that was published, and it looked at patients who are undergoing um, pulmonary resection uh, were Prospectively en enrolled in a single arm intervention study with a time match control, meaning that one arm of patients, they actually brush their teeth with CHG three times daily for five days before they had the operation and five art days or until the time of discharge afterwards and compared to the control. The control uh, unit here for patients actually just has standard of care and meaning of more of an education of oral hygiene versus those who use CHG over time before surgery had a lower rate of infection of 1.6% versus those who did not use the CHG before surgery was 4.9%. We also saw in this clinical study in reference to the cost estimate of one postoperative pneumonia would be around close to $500. So whereas if you would think for the prolonged hospital stay for pneumonia would range from $5,000 to $17,000 per patient. So if we can prevent these infections by just decolonizing a patient in the oral care, but also for the nose and on skin, we can prevent infections as well as have it cost effectiveness. Lastly here, this is a study in reference to how the effect of oral care hygiene as well as uh, using CHG or rent to prevent uh, VAP for patients after they had cardiovascular uh, surgery. So what this study showed was this was a study for ongoing patients for the heart surgery that were enrolled in the protocol. And they had two groups of patients, and in each group there was 150 patients. And one group, the patient actually used or CHG brushing and also for rent for one group, for group one, and group two, there was no oral decolonization. As you can see in the highlighted red box there, that overall they had a lower number of infections from not only for VAP, but also for surgical site infections, deep and strong infections as well, was lower than those patients in group two. But if you go even lower, even more so uh, in reference to those patients per the pathogen that you can look at here, in the red box as well, we know that Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseumonas, and uh, Staph aureus, and other pathogens here, they had the least amount of pathogens that was found to cause an infection versus those patients who did not use the oral decolonization actually doubled for those populations of patients in group two. So just doing a simple thing as decolonizing not only in the nose and, and the skin, but the oral care as well has a huge factor to not only prevent surgical site infections, but also for pneumonia as well for those patients too. So we know that the core universal infection control strategies to prevent all infections, not only pathogen specific, are very important. They are optimal hand hygiene, universal cleaning and disinfecting, vaccinations, as well as antibiotic stewardship with decolonization. However, when you're trying to prevent surgical site infections with a decolonization bundle, the patient plays a critical role in that process because we wanna make sure that they are adhering to the education process, meaning that you wanna make sure that the success of implementing 
a pre-mission showering protocol is included. You want to have a good partnership or active partnership with the with your patient, but also making sure the patient understands the protocol and why it's important to reduce these infections. Because there are certain four things that we have to have in place to make sure the patient's compliance is what education is key. They have to know the risk factors of the surgical site infection. So that should be provided to each individual before they have surgery. Also, the instructions to make sure they understand how to use the protocol when they're at home for bathing for the CHG. Also, it's extremely important for the patient to have access to the product itself. Patients have so much things going on right before they have surgery, their real world situations, they have family, and it's hard for them to go to a pharmacy to pick up things, but it would make it very easy and simple if the healthcare provider provides them with the product itself. Also, I know probably in my speech here today, several individuals may have checked their phone for something, for email or text, but we do know from clinical studies showing that if patients have reminder systems, it's key. That can be either via email, text on the phone, a phone call. All of these are very important that we should have to make sure patients have a high compliance rate to make sure they use things appropriately to prepare for surgery. And there was a study that was done back in 2014 that demonstrated that electronic reminders are effective in achieving patients' compliance for pre-admission shower procedures. As a result, they found that electronic alerts that were sent via text, emails, as well as voicemails was very appropriate and helped for patients. About 80% of the patients preferred to see or to receive a text message, which is not we can all, you know, agree to that, you know, in that sense for those patients. But also we know that for those who did not receive those reminders had a 66 reduction in the mean concentration of CHG on their skin. So it wasn't as high for that. So for this study that was done for those who had the reminder, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, some of the data shows that you can bathe two nights before, three nights before, sometimes five nights before. They're all correct. There's no wrong way of doing it, I would say. But as long as your patient is getting the bath before surgery, that's key to have. In this clinical study here, they had a mean concentration of using 4% on their skin. As you can see in group A, group A1, they actually received the phone calls for pre-showering two nights before in the morning of. In group B, they had the three showers before as well as the morning of for bathing. For those who actually had a higher concentration of CHG on the skin was in group one, they actually received the phone call, the electronic reminders to bathe appropriately. The exact same for those patients who had the three-day pre-admission showers as well, they had a higher mean of CHG concentration on the skin to prevent those infections that are caused by these bad MDROs that we have, as well as for MRSA and for Staph aureus. So for my take home question, take home message for you, I will say the following is surgical site infections are costly and have significant impact on both the patients and healthcare facilities. Implementation of a decolonization bundle is essential as well as demonstrated to reduce infection, not only for staph aureus, for MRSA or MSSA, but also for those gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bugs that we see, that we saw from the Duke University study as well, from those KPC, they also reduce the number of infections, you know, caused by these MDROs. Also, we know that antibiotic resistance is a global issue. It's a public health concern. We need to do more to make sure we are giving our antibiotics appropriately, but we also know that antiseptic are alternatives and they are very effective to prevent an infection that we can use not only in the surgical site prevention area. And lastly, preventing the development of surgical site infections is critical for improving patient safety and also promoting optimal outcomes for patient education. So it's always key. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I truly appreciate it and I'm open now for questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Rosie. We have got a few questions. Um, the first one is, um, have you heard of these new recommendations by the CDC that came out in March for prevention of MRSA? 
Um, yes, I think I, I do know what you're referring to. Um, it was in reference to the strategies to prevent the hospital onset of Staph aureus bloodstream infections in acute care settings. On this site, they also focused on the implementation um, interventions to not only to reduce um, devices like CLAPSIs, um, hemodialysis, and bloodstream infections, but also they focused on procedures related hospital associated infections like surgical site infections and VAPs as well. And they had strong um, information from public or published data to show why you should decolonize and use have decolonization strategies in place for evidence base to reduce these infections. So it wasn't only focused on not only for uh, on hospital on-site infections for uh, CLAPSIs, but they also focused on surgical site infections as well. Okay, that's great. So, so if you're not pre-op screening patients for MRSA, staph, or MSA, is it necessary to have those results to determine whether or not you will decolonize the patient? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know there are certain, there are several states that have mandated um, hospital screening, you know, from MRSA. I know my own state here in Illinois has done, done that, as well as California, and about five others, I do believe. But if your facility is moving away from screening by PCR, in the clinical study that I showed previously in that 20 hospitals over nine states, in that clinical study, which is big data, shows that if you were, did not have you know, any screening results or didn't know if the patient was positive for not only Staph aureus or MRSA or MSSA, you can still decolonize patients by using the antiseptic products as well as the CHG and, and probiotic to decolonize those patients. We also know that we want to make sure that we look for certain patients who have certain high risk for MRSA, and you look at those individuals, you know, coming from settings of high endemic rates of MRSA, patients who are living in extended care facility or nursing homes, those who are on dialysis, um, prior history of MRSA colonization and infection, if patients who are IV drug users, if a patient is transferred from an acute care setting within longer than 28 hours, 48 hours, also if you have a patient who requiring chronic wound care, and lastly, if a patient's undergoing a cardiothoracic surgery as well, it's key. Great. Do, do you see any uptake in the application of uh, decolonization strategies for post-discharge patients? Um, I would say yes, because we know that decolonization has successfully prevented disease during temporary high-risk circumstances, meaning that patients who have skin or recurrent skin infections or ICU care, those who are having knee or hip replacement as well as cardiac surgery. And using like that five-day decolonization uh, strategy to reduce those short-lived MRSA clearance is great. However, we know from the project CLEAR that I showed in reference to patients who are decolonizing post uh, uh, discharge, there is there are several months that they actually can be discharged over time and be decolonized, you know, by using that regimen that was in Project Clear that showed that you can reduce not only readmissions but also the MRSA infections for those patients who are discharged by doing that. Okay, that's great. Um, another question is, um, attendee says, I am from an ortho outpatient surgery center. What would be some good goals for antibiotic stewardship, even though we don't prescribe antibiotics post-op? We do use the typical day of pre-surgical antibiotic as a patient is going to the OR. I would say for antibiotic stewardship, um, it's very important when you have that protocol, that process in place, it's normally done by an infectious disease doctor who is making sure that the patient gets the appropriate antibiotics, the dosage and duration over time for a certain pathogen. If you don't have that in place, I think it's good to have evidence-based data to support the use of antiseptics like povonidine and CHG for those patients and making sure they're compliant with that before surgery, as well as aseptic techniques while the patient is there and also post-admission as well. So having that is key to it. 
Okay, that's great. That was very helpful, I'm sure. Should a CHG be rinsed after applying on a patient? So that could, uh, is a, a tricky uh, question, I would say, because there are several products that you can use for um, for CHG. So for that individual who asked that question, I would prefer to, um, if they would send me an email and I can explain in more detail, because CHG is used primarily not only for surgical site prevention, but also used in the ICU setting. And I want to make sure I answer it appropriately, but I also make sure I am speaking um, to what they're asking appropriately. There's different types of CHG products, and so I want to make sure I'm answering correctly, if possible. Okay, that's great. So that is uh, just a reminder to attendees. Uh, you can email Rosie directly with questions, um, especially if we don't get time to get through all the questions, and she will answer at her own convenience. Anyway, here is another one, Rosie. Is there a recommended cadence for pre-op oral rinse to go along with our current bundle? Um, yes. So you can use a CHG rinse as well as a toothbrush right before a patient has surgery. So that is also in the um, thoracic surgical um, guidelines as well as the um, the American Dental Association as well for trying to prevent patients for with pneumonia. So there are certain guidelines as well as uh, procedures in place to use and recommend that you do decolonize the mouth as well as the teeth by brushing before a patient has surgery. The same process you would do if you're using the povoniodine for the nose. The healthcare provider would provide not only the povoniodine in the nose but also the CHG the rinse as well as a toothbrush for patients. Okay, that's great. Um, I've got a question about, can you explain any difference, or what the difference is between 5% povidone iodine swabs and 10% povidone iodine swabs? Well, um, for the 5% um, povidone iodine swabs, they are, from my understanding, they are liquid uh, povonidine versus those that are 10% povonidine, they are gel. So it all depends, it's, it's more effect of the consistency of the povonidine. One is liquid and the other two is gel. Okay, that's great. Um, another question here is, with a known history of um, MRSA, should you use both um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Muprosine and PO7? I think what they're asking, if a patient does not have a history of MRSA or MSSA, do you need to use Muprosin to decolonize them? If that's the question, I would say with the, um, the, the, the rage of patients who are using mupirocin and also with the increase of resistance to it, if the patient cannot take uh, povonidine, I would recommend, yes, the next step would be to use mupirocin, which is the antibiotic, if a patient could not take or had any reactions to using povonidine. Okay, I think it looks like we've got no more questions, Rosie, and we're coming up to our, our limit. So um, thank you once again for a great and informative webinar, uh, and thank you again to our sponsors, Medline. Just another yeah, quick reminder. Oh, sorry. So just another quick reminder that we have now automated the post-webinar survey and certificate process. Um, the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. One lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the survey. Of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. So thank you once again for joining us today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you next time.